morning we are um, coming back to our series about sowing and reaping. Um, we started that in, in April, early May, and then we kind of got off on some other things, and now we're back. Um, and we've been talking about this, this kingdom principle of sowing and reaping. So i got a question. How, how, you know, Sandy back there smiling. How's those sunflowers doing? If, if you got that first, you know, some of you are shaking your head. If you were here for that first message, we passed out sunflower seeds, and some of you planted them, and transplanted them, and put them outside. And Why? Because we were learning about what does it mean to, to sow and reap. And the reality is, we, we, our, our signature verse for the series is in Galatians 6, verse 7, where Paul writes these words. He says, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, this he will also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. And, and so far in this series, we've been talking about sowing to the Spirit. We've been so, talking about sowing into the things of the kingdom. We've been talking about sowing good seed. And we do that because we want to focus on the good stuff first, on the authentic, what God really desires. But on the next, next couple, three weeks, we're going to talk about what happens with seed that isn't so quite so good. I don't know about you, but anybody here ever sown any bad seed? I, I, I mean, maybe it wasn't intentional. Maybe it wasn't something that you thought you were, you were going to do. But you look back and you're like, man, I, I sowed to the flesh. I sowed to my own desires. I sowed into the things of the world. And I look back and like, those were seeds I hoped didn't produce a harvest. Amen? Because there's a lot of people who, are, well, they, they sow bad seed during the week, and then we come to church. And sometimes it's not intentional. Sometimes we act badly or you know, unintentionally, or sometimes it is intentionally. We sow bad seed, and then we show up like, oh, God, please. Please don't let there be a harvest. Right? Because we've been learning about the law of the seed, right? And the law of the seed says this, a seed will produce its own kind. Right? A, a seed will produce more than itself, right? And a seed will do what God has designed it to do. And the thing about the law of the seed is it's universal. It applies to believers and to unbelievers. It applies to good seed and the bad seed. Because, I mean, if, if I sow a corn seed, what am I going to get? Or I'm going to get corn, and I'm going to get back more. When it rains, let me tell you, there's 18 rows of sweet corn across the road over there that it will produce some corn when it rains. Amen? Amen. We're just well waiting for the rain, right? But what if I sow ragweed? What if we go out there, and Stephen comes over and helps me, and, and we sow a nice big long row of ragweed? What are we getting? We're getting ragweed. And are we going to get just a couple ragweed seeds? <laughs> and it's like, ah, that's how that works. Man, I tell you what, once it gets started, man, it is just a what? It is a, a plethora of ragweed seed will be coming our way. Because seeds are designed to do what seeds are designed to do. And they'll do that. They seek to do that. And see, the law of the seed works whether we sow into the spirit or whether we sow into the flesh. It works the same way. Now, I don't know if I sow bad seed. Here's the question people ask. If I sow bad seed, if I sow it this week, or maybe I'll, I'll accidentally sow some in the future, or I, I sow some bad seed, what's going to happen to that seed? I, I, what's going to happen with that seed? Because, I, I, I mean, I, I'm a believer now, right? And, and so surely when I sow bad seed, God is going to do some stuff to whack the bad seed that I sow because now I'm a believer. That seed is surely not going to do what it was created to do. Right? Come on, Pastor. Tell me that's the way it is. I don't know. Some of you are like, I don't know, Pastor. I don't know what's going on there. Well, it's the law of the seed. This morning, we're going to look at a couple very well-known stories, and we're going to look at some stories where some bad seed got sown and talk about what happened with that seed. And then next week we're, and the week after, we're going to talk about how is it that we overcome, that we have victory over bad seed. But I'm going to start this morning with the story of Abraham and Sarah. 
Now, most of you know parts of that story. Actually, long before they were Abraham and Sarah, they were Abram and Sarah, right? And, and so, as we look at that story, you know, Abram was what, in the land of Ur, and God said, I want you to pack up your family, and I want you to go to the land you don't know. Abram was faithful, he packed them up, and they went, and when they got there, God said to him, I'm going to give you all the land you see, and then a little later, he upped the ante and said, I'm going to make your descendants as many as the stars in the sky. I'm going to make you a great nation. Now, the only problem was, Abram didn't have an heir. It's like, I got this great promise, this generational promise, but I don't have an heir. I don't have a son. And Sarai was barren. Sarai had not been able to have children. And not only that, now they are 75 and 74. And what? They're getting past the childbearing age. And they're like, I, I don't think this is going to happen. What are we going to do? But then God shows up and he says, here, hey, Abram, I got a promise for you. I'm going to give you and Sarai a son. And so at the age of 75 and 74, they're believing God. Now, here's the interesting thing. 12 years go by. And Abram and Sarah are doing their part. They're trying to, you know, have a baby. And, 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 and nothing's happening. Now, somebody, can, who can do the math on me? 75 plus 12 is what? 87. Eight, thank you, Barb. 87. 87. Abram's now 87. Any 87-year-old guys in the room? Now they go... Well, almost 87. There's a couple. I won't point you out. But the reality is, you know, 87, like, hey, we're still trying to have a baby. We're still trying. You know, it's not working. And so Sarai looks and says, gosh, it's me. You know, I'm barren. I'm, I'm old. I'm past, I'm past the age. We've got to do something different. And so what she decided to do? She decides she's going to give her Egyptian handmaiden, Hagar, to Abraham. Now, in that culture, it was part of the culture that what? You could give a slave to your husband, and if she had a child, then it would be your child. And so she's like, hey, here's the plan. Here's what we're going to do. This, this God plan isn't working. So what we're going to do is I'm going to get Hagar, and I'm going to send her into Abraham, and he's going to lie with her. And if she gets pregnant, maybe she'll give him a son. Now, here's the question. Was Sarah operating in the plans of God? Okay, go with me. Right? That's not what God's plan was, right? He said, here's what I want you to do. Here's what I want to happen. Um, but anyway, so Sarah says, here's what we're going to do. So she gives Hagar to Abraham. He lies with her. She becomes pregnant. But the problem is, what happens? Once she becomes pregnant, Sarah becomes jealous. Why? Because this woman is going to give my husband a son, and I can't. And she starts treating her really awful, really terrible, in an awful way. And, and she doesn't know what to do, so she goes to Abram and says, Abram, how, how shall I handle this? And he said, well, do whatever you want. So he treats her even worse, and Hagar, it gets so bad that Hagar, who is pregnant with Abraham's baby, takes off into the wilderness by herself. Now, who knows that that that's a desperate situation for Hagar. But let's look. Are you ready? So Sarai was sowing into the spirit. Sarai was sowing into the things of God. She was sowing into the things of the world. She was sowing some bad seed. She was sowing to the flesh. What kind of seeds was she sowing? Oh, I don't know. How about dis disobedience? You know, jealousy, meanness. She's sowing those seeds into Hagar. Um, and Hagar is wandering in the wilderness with no way to care for herself or an un unborn baby. But Genesis 16, verse 7 says this. Now the angel of the Lord found her by the spring of water in the wilderness, by the spring on the way of Sir. And he said, Hagar, Sarai's maid, where, are you, where have you come from and where are you going? Sarai, what are you doing out here? Right? Basically the question. Um, and she said, I am fleeing from the presence of my mistress, Sarai. Then the angel of the Lord said, return to your mistress and submit yourself to her authority. Moreover, the angel of the Lord said to her, I will greatly multiply your descendants so that they will be too many to count. Uh, now wait a minute. 
That sounds a little familiar. The promise to Abram was your descendants will be as many as the sand on the, on the sea. Now God takes that same promise and he gives it to Hagar. Wow. What an interesting picture that her son would be the father of many nations. Now, here's what I want you to understand. Those, when we sow bad seed, those who are affected by the seed, those who are impacted by the seed, those who end up harvesting from the seed, watch this now, God will watch over them. God will care for them. God will bless them if they'll allow him to. What happens to Hagar? God shows up and says, hey, I want you to do this. And what? He's caring and watching over her, and she allows the Lord a place in her life. Because think about it. Is Hagar the one that sowed the bad seed? No. She's the one reaping the harvest from the seed that has been sown. See, we have to realize whether it's good or bad seed, but today we're talking about bad seed. Sometimes when we sow that seed, we're the one who reap the harvest. Right? That, that's true of the bad. It's true of the good. Sometimes we sow good seed and we reap a harvest out of that good seed. But sometimes we sow the seed and we're not the ones who, what, reap the harvest. Other people reap the harvest. Other people around us, other people in the next generation or the generation after, they're the ones who get to reap the harvest from the seed that we're sowing. For example, if we sow bad seed into our kids, we may not reap that. But the reality is, down the road, they may be impacted by the harvest that comes forth from those seeds. And God wants to encourage us that even though we, we may have sown those seeds, that he is watching over those who are reaping the harvest. He's interceding for those reaping the harvest. He will bless those who are reaping that harvest if they'll allow him to come into the midst of the situation. But I want you to notice that the angel of the Lord didn't finish yet. Verse 11 says, And the angel said to the, of the Lord, said to her further, Behold, you are with child, and you will bear a son, and you shall call him his name Ishmael, because the Lord has given heed to your affliction. And he will be a wild donkey of a man, and his hand will be against everyone, and everyone's hand will be against him, and he will live in the east of all his brothers. So God says, they, the, Hagar says, You're going to have a son, you're going to call him Ishmael, because God has heard, God has seen your misery. He's seen what you're going through. And this Ishmael will be a wild donkey of a man. His hands will be against everyone. He will live in hostility towards everyone. And he'll live east of his brothers. Now, who are Ishmael's brothers? Well, in 13 years, Abraham and Sarah will have a son that God said named Isaac, who will give birth to Esau and Jacob. And Jacob will have 12 sons. Jacob's name will be changed to Israel. And they will become the 12 tribes of Israel. Those are Ishmael's brothers. And so what happens? Hagar goes back to Abraham's house. She submits to Sarai. Ishmael is born. And for the next few years, he's, he's the son of promise. I want you to notice what it says in Genesis 25. It says, This is the account of the family line of Abraham's son Ishmael, whom Sarah slave Hagar the Egyptian bore to them. These are the names of the sons of Ishmael listed in the order of their birth. Now, forgive me, I'm not going to pronounce all 12 of those. Or even attempt to pronounce all 12 of those, all right? But verse 16 says, These were the sons of Ishmael, and these are the names of the 12 tribal rulers according to their settlements and groups. Now, now, wait a minute. That sounds familiar, doesn't it? Ishmael had 12 sons and had 12 tribes. Who else had that? Wait a minute. Isaac and Jacob had 12 sons who were the 12 tribes of Israel. What an interesting picture. In verse 17 says, Ishmael lived 137 years, and he breathed his last and died, and he was gathered to his people, and his descendants settled in the area from Havilah to Shur, near the eastern border of Egypt, as you go forward to Asher. They lived in hostility to all the tribes 
relate, related, say related, related, related to them. Who are the tribes related to them? The 12 tribes of Israel. The 12 tribes of Ishmael lived in what hostility towards the 12 tribes of Israel. What an interesting picture. So who are the descendants of Ishmael today? Who is it that lives to the east? Who is it that lives in hostility? It is the Arab nations that still exist today. And in fact, if we go a little step further, what we discover is you know, that most Muslims, you know, the, the basics of Muslim faith believe that, that Muhammad was born as a descendant of Ishmael and is from the 12 tribes of Ishmael the leader of the Muslim world. And they're related to the 12 tribes of Israel. How many of you know that even today that the Arab nations, many Muslims, would like nothing more for the 12 tribes of Israel, for the nation of Israel to be wiped, the Jews to be wiped off the face of the map? Why? Why? Israel is their father. Why? Where did all that start? It started 3,500 years ago with bad seed that was sown that has what? Produced a harvest that has been sown and produced a harvest and sown and produced a harvest and sown and produced a harvest for 3,500 years. That's where all that started. What an interesting picture. See, God said to Abraham, here's what I want you to do. I want you to be faithful to your wife, and I'll give you a son. I want you to sow in the spirit, sow into what I'm saying, sow what I want you to do. But here's the deal. Abraham, Abram, what? Listen to his wife. Sarai said, here's what we ought to do. He agreed. They came up with an alternative plan. Guys, it taken 12 years. We've waited 12 years. Come on. Surely we need to get involved and figure out how to get this done on our own, sow into our own plans, our own ideas, our own things. And God's like, hey, look what happens when we do that. Seed gets sown. And what's going to happen with the seed that is sown? It will produce a harvest. It's the law of the seed. Well, Brian, I don't want it to produce a harvest. It doesn't matter what you want. When I sow the seed, it has the potential, what, to bring forth a great harvest, whether it's good or bad. Now, here's the good news. Even though Abram sowed to the flesh the first time around, God gave him a second chance, and he was, what, faithful the second time, and we have Ishmael, and he sowed into the Spirit. But we have to understand that good or bad, a seed is powerful. Good or bad, a seed will produce a harvest. Good or bad, a seed has the potential to have a generational impact. I don't like that. See, we have to understand how kingdom works. You say, well, Brian, I, you know, that's just one example. Well, let me give you another example. How about King David? We all love David, right? Because David was a like man after God's own heart. Right? Um, he loved, he was ruling over Jerusalem. Incredible. He brought the Ark of the Covenant in Jerusalem, set up 24-7 worship. Just incredible stuff going on with David, right? But one night, he's like hanging out on the roof. And he looks over at a, at a neighboring house, and there's Bathsheba taking a bath. And, and she's good looking. And David has a desire for her, and so he sends a servant over to get Bathsheba. She comes over to the house, they get cozy, and they sleep together. Three or four weeks later, Bathsheba comes knocking at the door. David. And my husband Uriah has been out in battle with the army for months. David is yours. It has, it, the only person it could be is yours. And suddenly David finds himself in a mess. So what's David decide to do? The same thing a lot of other people do. Maybe we'll bury the seed. If we bury it deep enough, there's no way that baby's coming up, right? We're just going to cover it up and cover it up until hopefully it'll never, ever, ever you know, come to light of what took place. And so what's David decide to do? David decides um, that he's going to uh, call Uriah back from 
the front. So he sends a messenger out, says, Uriah, you need to come home, I need to see you. And his plan is, Uriah will come home, and, and they'll have a meeting, and because he's home, he'll go back to his house, and he'll get comfortable, and, and he'll see his wife, and, and next thing you know, we'll be able to say, what? It's Uriah's baby. But Uriah is an honorable man. And he says, you know what, David? Because my men are still at the front, because my men are still in battle, I'm not going to go home and enjoy the comforts of home while they're still out there. And so he sleeps on the ground outside the palace gate. Refuses to go. David's 0 for 1. He's trying to eat some dirt, but he's 0 for 1, right? And then what happens? He says, well, I'll, I'll fix it. I'll get some alcohol involved. Right? That'll fix everything. A little alcohol. And, and so he brings Uriah in and gets him drunk. And then he says, hey, Uriah, why don't you go home? Hoping that he won't be quite as honorable while he's intoxicated. But what's Uriah to do? Uriah is now like, no, I'm still not going to go home and enjoy the comforts. I'm, and he sleeps on the ground again outside the gate. David's 0 for 2. This covering up the seed thing ain't working very good. And so David throws it all in, right? He says, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to send him back to the front. And he writes a letter to the, the commander, Joab. And he says, what? Uriah, I want you to carry this letter to the commander. And so Uriah, being faithful, carries the letter. He goes back to the front. He hands it to, to uh, Joab. And the letter says to Joab, the commander, here's, from the king, here's what I want you to do. Put Uriah out in front of the army in the next battle. And as the battle begins, I want everybody else to back up. And he'll be out there by himself, and he'll be killed in battle. Problem solved. And what happens? Joab does exactly what he was told. They put him out front, Uriah gets killed, and word comes back to Jerusalem that Uriah was killed in battle. He was a hero. He died for his country. After a time of mourning, David brings Bathsheba to the palace, and he marries her. And he lies with her. Claiming the baby is now his. And miraculously, even though months have gone by, Bathsheba becomes with child. You know, she's now with child, and guess what? She delivers a full-term baby about three months early. <laughs> and guess what? Everybody bought it. Right? Problem solved. I covered it up, but what do we know about seed? Come on, Steve, shake his head. That seed ain't going nowhere, is it? You ever bury a seed and all it never come up? Come on now. You know better than that, right? So what happened? Well, <clears throat> what kind of seeds were David sowing? David's got quite a list here, right? Let's see, he's got dishonor and deceit and covetousness and adultery and sexual immorality, and now he's got conspiracy and deception and murder. Man, man he's got a whole, he had a whole bag full of bad seed, man. He's been sowing it everywhere, right? So what's going to happen? That seed's going to produce a harvest. Fast forward about a year now. 2 Samuel 12, the prophet Nathaniel comes to him and says, The Lord said, and thus says the Lord God of Israel, It is I who appointed you over Israel, and it is I who delivered you from the hand of Saul. I also gave you the house of your master and your master's wives into your care. And I gave you the house of Israel and Judah. And if it had been too little, I would have added to you even many more things. Let me translate that for you. God's like, David, David, I gave you everything. I gave you the kingdoms. I gave you the house. I gave you, I gave you absolutely everything. If that wasn't enough, I would have given you even more. And we could camp right there forever and talk about that. But the Lord wasn't, wasn't done. Look at verse 9. Why have you despised the word of the Lord by doing evil in his sight? You have struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword, having taken his wife to be your wife, and having killed him with the sword and the sons of Amon. Let me translate that. Dude, what were you doing? Why were you sowing that seed when I had given you good seed to sow? But now you've sown into the flesh. And that seed is going to produce a harvest that will lead to corruption. <clears throat> Verse 10. Now therefore the sword shall never depart from your house, because you have despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Verse 11. 
Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will raise up evil against you from your own household. And I will even take your wives before your eyes and give them to your companions. And he will lie with your wives in broad daylight. Indeed, you did what you did in secret, I will do this thing before all Israel and under the sun. What's God saying? That seed you sow, David, it's going to be exposed. It's going to produce a harvest that everyone will see. Everyone will know. It's the law of the seed. A seed will produce what is designed to produce. Verse 13 says what? Then David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Well, suddenly David now has fallen under conviction. He starts confessing his sin. He's repenting before the Lord. He's like, oh Lord, I, now I know. I'm so sorry, God. I, I'm falling on my face before you. I'm repenting of my sin. And Nathan said to David, the Lord will also take away your sin and you shall not die. Let's well, stop right there for a second. What happens? David repents. God says, I'm forgiving you. You have been forgiven. You're not going to die for your own mess. I will forgive you and take care of you. However, there's a big fat however in the text. However, because you by this deed you have given occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme, this child also that is born to you shall surely die. He said, now wait a minute, David repented. David said, oh Lord, I, forgive me for what I did. Wipe, God wiped away his sins. David no longer had to pay the ultimate price for his own sin. So everything ought to be okay now. Everything ought to be fixed. Everything should be good. Everything, all those bad seeds should be gone. All those bad seeds suddenly, they got sterilized. All those bad seeds, all, all of a sudden, they're just, they're nowhere to be found. From here on out, crisis averted. And Listen, there are a whole bunch of people who think if I just confess my sin to Jesus, it's all better. He'll fix it all. That's not the kingdom. It says, however, watch, however, even though David had been forgiven, guess what? Nathan said, one, his son from Bathsheba would die. Now that's about justice, and that's a whole different issue in the Old Testament. But notice this. Even though David had been forgiven, the seeds he had sown, the seeds he had sown to the flesh, those bad seeds were still out there, and they were going to do what they were created to do. You say, well, Brian... I don't, I don't know. I don't know what you're talking about there. I don't know what you mean. Well, who can tell me about David's kids? Come on. How many of you know the word well enough to know what about David's kids, right? First Chronicles 3 says these are the sons of David who were born to him in Hebron. We'll talk about that in a second. Um, the first word was Ammon. Um, the second word was Daniel and Absalom and Ajaniah and, and Shepta and Etorim. Um, David had, now you got to understand, before David was king over all of Israel, he was the king of Judah. And the capital was Hebron, and he was there seven and a half years. And David had, while David was there, he had six sons by six wives. Six different women. All right? And then, then, guess what? Then he becomes king over all of Israel, and he makes Jerusalem the capital. And so they moved to Jerusalem. And we go on, it says, in Jerusalem he reigned 33 years, so seven and a half years in Hebron, 33 years in Jerusalem. And they were born to him there. Bathsheba gave him four sons, and he had nine other sons while he was there, in addition to the sons of his concubines and Tamar, their sister. Tamar, their sister, excuse me. Now, I want to ask you a question. So David moves to Jerusalem. He's got six sons. It takes some time to build a new temple or build a new palace. So some years ago, his sons are now teenagers. All before Bathsheba shows up on the scene. And while David is at home in the palace sowing bad seed with Bathsheba and Uriah and all these things, he's just not sowing seed into his life. He's sowing that seed into his boys. A seed that is going to produce a harvest. And God says, I want you to know, David, that seed, that bad seed you sowed into those boys, it will become a sword in your family. 
They will bear a harvest. Oh, but Brian, they even repented. We're going to talk about overcoming seed, bad seed, and seed. But listen, that bad seed is still there, and God can do some things, and we'll talk about those things. But we have to realize that bad seed will produce what it was designed to produce. You say, well, what happened? Well, it all started when David's first son, <coughs> um, Amon, rapes his half-sister Tamar. And then David's third son um, kills um, Amon. They kill Amon for what they did to Tamar. All right? So the sword will rise. So they're, you know, they're, his boys are killing one another. All right? But then Absalom's the one who killed Amon. And so Absalom takes off because he's afraid of his father. But after three years, David relents and he comes back into the kingdom. But Absalom isn't content just to be a son and wait for his turn. For the kingdom, right? So he goes out to the, the gate of Jerusalem, and as people come in to see the king, he says, hey, why are you here? What do you want to see the king about? And they would tell him, oh, yeah, if I was king, I'd give you that. I'd do that very thing right there you want, if I was king. For four years, he stood at the gate, told everybody who came in, I'd, I'd give you what you want. I'd do what you want. I, I, I mean, I'm making this promise. And for, after four years, there was a whole big group of people who were like, man, we're digging on Absalom being king. And so they named Absalom king, and even some of David's own men are now faithful to Absalom. And so David has to flee. His own son is looking to kill him, and so he can take the throne. And so David runs and hides. Um, Absalom mounts up his army, and they go out to kill David. But David's men win the victory, and Absalom, what happened to him? He's got long, flowing hair. He can ride a horse, gets his hair stuck in a tree, and he's hanging in the tree. can't get down because he's hair, hanging by his hair. And Joab, remember Joab? He finds him, the commander of the, of the army, and kills him. What happened? David's family is a train wreck. Why? Bad seed. Bad seed will produce a harvest. And we have to understand that bad seed many times will have a generational impact. Now we don't want to hear that either, Pastor. What we want to hear, can we find some good stuff? Can't we just find that everything will be all hunky dory? Well, I want you to understand that we that generationally, you know, I won't read to you, it's there in your notes, but in Exodus 34 it talks about that the sins of the father go to the third and fourth generation. Now a lot of people look at that and they want to say, well, you know, that I'm going to be just like my dad. Listen to me. Ezekiel makes it absolutely clear. You and I all have a choice. I don't care what seed got sown into you. I don't care whether it was good or bad or indifferent. You have a choice of how you're going to, what you're going to do now. That there is no you have to be. God's not punishing the next generation. What that's saying is if you sow bad seed, there's a good chance that the next generation is, is going to what? Harvest that seed and then they're going to replant it. People say to me on that, well, wh why do we see things you know, exponentially changing in our nation? It's because of the seed we sow. Come on, think about it. Mom and dad have four kids and they sow bad seed to the four kids. And then those four kids reap a harvest of that, and then they take the harvest from their seed, and they each have four kids, and, that, and their families, all of a sudden, one family with bad seed becomes 16 families with bad seed, and if there's nothing to interrupt the cycle, it is exponential what happens. Uh, that's why he's called you and I, what? To be light and soul and what? To come into the world so that the cycle can be broken. I tell people all the time, you don't have to be what your dad was. You don't have to be what your mom is. In Christ Jesus, you can be set free to live the life he's created you to live, if you let him. But listen, if you're not willing, I guarantee you the seed's coming. The harvest is going to come. What an important picture in our lives. We have to understand that. The same is true of good seed. Right? If we sow good seed into our kids, what's, what's the promise of Scripture? Train up a child in the way in which he should go, and he will what? Return to that. Will not be far from that. That's a sowing and reaping scripture. If you sow the ways of the Lord into the kid, you're saying, man, I don't see that seed growing yet. 
Come on, Jesus, grow that seed. Or maybe it's like they've been covering up the good seed, right? But what happens? God's promise is you sow that good seed, it will produce a harvest. It will bring forth a harvest. A harvest they're going to have to deal with. Their own harvest they're going to have to do something with. And the reality is, we have to be careful what seed we're sowing. Because I want you to understand, we live in a world where we have been deceived, goes back to Galatians 6, into believing, I can sow whatever seed I want to sow. I can sow it in my life, and in my family, in my marriage, and you know what? It's not going to make any difference. We've been deceived into believing that we can sow bad seed into our kids, allow the school system and the culture and entertainment and the TV and the music to sow those seeds into our kids, and nothing will ever happen. That is the deception of the devil. You know, one of the greatest deceptions in the church has been, we can just look the other way and it'll be okay. That's a lie of the devil. That's a lie. The seed we sow will produce a harvest. Now, does God enable us to overcome those things? Absolutely. Can you be with us in the midst of those? Absolutely question I think for us today has to be this. What seeds in your bag? The pouch that you're carrying around and you're sowing, what seeds are you sowing? Are they kingdom seeds? Are they seeds sown into the spirit? Are they seeds that bring life and hope and truth and righteousness? Or are we sowing seed? Seed that does not line up with His Word. Seed that does not honor God. Because listen, it doesn't matter what you're sowing. It will produce a harvest. You say, well, Brian, I, 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 I've had this seed and I'm just, I'm struck. Listen, God wants to deal with your seed. Right? That's the issue. Not that we're, any of us in this room are perfect yet. But the reality is, the goal, uh, the focus ought to be, am I sowing less and less bad seed and more and more good seed, right? The seed I get to sow every single day of my life, what kind of seed are we sowing? You say, well, sometimes the ground seems hard. I, I didn't ask that. I asked what kind of seed we're sowing. What's in your bag? What's in your seed bag this morning? What have you been sowing this week? What have you been sowing? What has been being sown into you? But here's the, the bigger piece. What, what are we sowing? And the reality is, if we're not sowing a seed that will bring forth a harvest of righteousness, it's not good seed. Yeah, Brian, but the world, I know the world says. We're not talking about the world. We're talking about the king and his kingdom. What seed are we sowing? And next week, we'll talk about what to do with the seed that's already been sown. But you know what the first thing that has to happen? If you want to stop a harvest, a bad harvest, you've got to stop sowing the seed. Right? Amen? Step number one, stop sowing. Right? If i got good seed, I better get started sowing. But if i got bad seed, I need to stop sowing. And I just want to challenge this this morning. Not because of what Brian said, because what's the Holy Spirit speaking in your heart right now. What seeds are you sowing? What seeds do your kids and grandkids and great-grandkids, what seeds have been sowing in their lives? What seeds are you sowing where you go to work or where you go to have lunch or where you go to get your hair done or where you go to do some other things? What seeds are you sowing? You say, well, Brian, I'm not always pleased with the seed that I sow. Why not ask Jesus to fill your bag with his seed today? Say, well, Lord, deal with that seed, that harvest. Because maybe, maybe we've reaped a harvest from like, I just got to keep sowing that. No, 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 we don't have to anymore. Jesus wants to set you free to sow the seed that he desires. 
So in a moment, I'm just going to pray and, and then we're going to sing. But I just want you to allow Holy Spirit to speak to your heart this morning. About the seed that's in your hand that you've been sowing. You say, Lord, start with me. Amen? Amen. Start with me. This is about your neighbor. This is about the person behind you in the pew. About, about me. About you. Now, what's, what seed do you have for me? Well, Father, we just thank you for your word this morning. And Lord, we ask that you would just speak to our hearts, Holy Spirit. We just open ourselves right now. Lord, we hold our hands out. We hold out our, our seed bag and say, Lord, show me what's in here. And if there's anything not pleasing to you, Lord, right now, Lord, would you just help me to, to release that, to give that to you, to let you destroy that seed that it might not bring forth the harvest anymore. Father, we just thank you. for 